Good Sabbath, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start with a lift. I'm going to play Love Lifted Me by James Rowe. After I play, Alan will come with the announcements and the opening prayer. Welcome everyone to our Sabbath service today. I'd like to say I've been very encouraged lately to see God's people getting along well and showing love for each other. And I've seen this locally among multiple denominations even. I've seen this in local groups with the same basic beliefs and I'm also experiencing it in online meetings. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for the love, the consideration, and even the forgiveness that I've been seeing. It reminds me of what things will be like in the kingdom. Of course, that's actually how followers of Jesus Christ should act anyway. But again, I'm very encouraged, so keep it up. I mentioned on Wednesday that we will not be able to have our regularly scheduled Zoom session after services today, but we will resume our Zoom meetings next Sabbath, and we hope to see you all then. I'm looking forward to it as always. I think that's it. Let's open with prayer. Our great Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son who died for the sins of the world, and thank you for your many blessings, actually. And thank you particularly for the brethren, for the love they have for us and the knowledge they share with us. We will all need to rely on each other more and more as we see the time growing closer to the return of your Son. Help us always to be tolerant of one another and learn from each other as we grow to be more like your Son. Help us to help others in a manner consistent with your will. We ask all things according to your will, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first hymn is page 226, By This Shall All Men Know, by Ross Jetsam. This hymn text is based on John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. That's hymn 226, by this shall all men know. A new commandment I will give To magnify the way to live Love each other as you You are my disciples, you're my sister and 
Our next hymn is on page 242, If I Have Not Charity by Dwight Armstrong. This hymn text is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, better known as the love chapter. That's page 242, If I Have Not Charity. And now for today's message, Alan Holt with Forbearing One Another. Good and welcome, everyone. It is great to have all of you with us today. And when I say welcome everyone, I mean welcome everyone. I know we've talked about church authority in the past and what's sometimes required of those who might attend church services. Well, our position is that all are welcome. It doesn't matter what, what, 
<clears throat> it doesn't matter what one might currently believe. I know of at least one church that requires that you read a copy of their beliefs and then sign a paper stating that you agree with all those beliefs before you attend. But especially for newer people, how can you agree with something you may not have proven to yourself yet? And also sometimes we learn that we made an error. And we need to repent or correct the error. Well, none of us is perfect. As we learn and grow, we sometimes find that what we once believed, well, it might not be correct. Despite many churches saying that they are the ones with the real truth, I believe that no church, nor organization that is, no human being has an absolutely perfect understanding of God in our Bibles. I wish we did. We won't have that perfect understanding, at least not until Jesus Christ returns. Let me tell you a slightly modified version of an old joke. You probably heard it. It's slightly modified, but uh, so God's kingdom arrives here on the earth. Now, when it does, people are asked which Christian denomination they belong to. Now, one person reporting to be Methodist was taken to Area 12. Another claiming Catholicism was taken to Area 3. Yet another was claiming to be Baptist, and they were taken to Area 27. Then another person showed up. After saying they were Lutheran, they were quickly on their way to Area 23. But as they walked by an area marked Area 5, they were told to be very quiet and make no sound until they get past Area 5. So then they did. Like, what was that all about, asked the Lutheran. Well, you see, the denomination in Area 5 I believe they're the only ones that made it into the kingdom. Well, that's the joke, actually, but... In the joke, we're supposed to insert the name of the denomination that was in Area 5. I guess we're trying to give them a hard time. But the truth is, of course, that there will be no denominations in the kingdom. You can look at the future kingdom of God, his last great day, or anywhere else after the return of Christ, and it's clear, if it's not obvious in the first place, that there will be no denominations. Not when man's rule ends and the rule of Jesus Christ begins. So why are there so many denominations today? Why can't we all just get along? Why do we have such divisiveness if we all claim to follow the same God? As a young boy, I, I, had, I had recently moved to Springfield, Kentucky, not too far from here. One day I ran across a young man I'd never seen before. He was exceptionally polite and seemed to have many of the same interests that I did. Now, my interests at the time were not exactly typical for my age, so I was happy to find a new friend that shared my interest. But despite being about the same age as I was, I'd never seen him in school. I asked him about that, and he said he went to a different school. Now, at the time, I wasn't aware there was even another school in this relatively small town. When I got home, I asked about this school and why I didn't attend there. So I asked my family what this was all about. I was told this, that this young man and the school he went to were of a different Christian religion, or maybe denomination, than our family was, that I was to avoid this young man from now on. I was not to have anything to do with him, because he believed differently from us. So what this all boils down to is that we have numerous, uh, even thousands of Christians with differing beliefs. In North America alone, according to ReligiousTolerance.org, there are more than 1,500 different Christian faith groups, most of them teaching different things. In most cases, the individual denomination demands that their congregation believe whatever it is that they teach, and they often prohibit anyone in their group to have anything to do with another denomination. In my case, I was not even allowed to spend any time with my newfound but very temporary friend from that different denomination. Is this what Jesus Christ had in mind for his church today? You know, the church is actually the body of believers in Christ. It isn't a building or denomination. I know we commonly use the word church to refer to a building or a specific denomination. But all those who are doing their very best to follow Jesus Christ are part of the church. Our goal is to learn and grow closer to Jesus Christ. There should be no divisions, no shunning those that aren't in 100% agreement with us in every minute detail. If we stay apart and not welcome each other, nor ever fellowship with each other, how can we all learn and grow? If we decide that we, or our church, has everything figured out and there's no need to learn anything else, then 
we become stagnant. We fail to continue to grow. And I believe that those that do so often, at least in part, do so because of pride. They want to feel like they're the only ones who are right and that no other group, no other church has a correct view like they do. I guess they might have been the ones in my Area 5 of my joke earlier. We often hear from church leadership that we're not to ever even listen to anyone of a different belief than ours. Of course, the idea there is they say that, you know, someone may occasionally convince us of something that we don't currently believe and draw us astray. Or it could be they're drawing us closer to the truth. But I suspect that what's, that's what most churches really fear. They fear that their congregants might hear something that might make them question what they've been taught. They certainly don't want to deal with that. They prefer things just to stay the way they are. All the truth and all the error. Static, unchanging, with little or no growth. In fact, many churches tell their congregants not to even talk among themselves about religious matters. I've seen this. So questions and discussion of all spiritual matters are only allowed when speaking with official church leadership. At one time, I actually belonged to a group like that. That's one reason I know. Turn to Proverbs chapter 27. If you would, that's Proverbs chapter 27, going to verse 17. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Now, of course, what I just mentioned is certainly not the case in all churches, but many do tend to frown on people talking to others about their beliefs, particularly if those beliefs might potentially be something different than what they're teaching. What does the Bible have to say about us talking to each other? Is that really discouraged? Should we avoid that? Again, Proverbs 27, verse 17. I'm sure you've heard this before. It says, Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. The Bible in basic English says, Iron makes iron sharp, so a man makes sharp his friend. People learn from one another, just as iron sharpens iron. Church leadership is there just for that, to lead but not to dictate, not to always be the final understanding of what Scripture is teaching us. Turn over to Acts 17, if you would, next. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Now, leaders in our churches often devote their lives to studying God's Word. Many spend hours researching their Word to share it with us. Yet, none of us are perfect. All of us can and have made mistakes, and sometimes misunderstand uh, a passage here or there. So while it can certainly be very helpful to listen to our leaders who've studied for quite some time in most cases, it's still our responsibility to prove everything to ourselves. We should always be like the Bereans. Again, Acts 17, verse 10. Here Paul tells us about those Bereans. Acts 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night, unto Berea, who coming there went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. So they were ready. They were eager to hear the word. I can just see them listening intently and taking notes on what's being said. But then what did they do? What did they do? Continuing. And they searched the scripture daily whether those things were so. They obviously proved all things from Scripture before accepting what was said as truth. You might notice our logo near the very bottom of your screen, if you can see it, if you can make it out. The top line reads, prove all things. So it's kind of our motto around here, but anyway. The Bereans, what was the result of listening to others speak about the Word of God and then studying their own Bibles to confirm what was said? Verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Apparently several. And that's the way it should be done. Listen to others. Discuss things among ourselves. Learn and continue to grow. And I've said this many times before, and I could probably never say it enough, but you should never, ever, ever just believe anything I say or really anything anyone else says about the Bible should not believe anything 
until after we've examined our own Bibles and confirmed what was said is true, just as the Bereans did. Only then will we truly believe anyway. But segregating ourselves into small or tiny groups, each believing our group is superior to any other group, well, that's not what our Bibles teach. This isn't something that just started happening today. This started a very, very long time ago. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now, this was actually going on back in Jesus' day. So today we can say things like, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Methodist. Uh, I follow Joel Osteen, or I follow Charles Stanley. What would Paul say about that? Again, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Here's what Paul says. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Divisions that we see even today. Be that you perfectly join together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them that which are of the house of Cleo, that there are contentions or quarrels among you. So the brethren have been quarreling or fighting over differing beliefs or perhaps even who is the best teacher. Let's continue to see what Paul had to say about this in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I am a Paul, and I am a Apollos, and I am Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Let us, unless any should say that I had baptized in my own name. So Paul is suggesting that people were treating their teachers well, almost as they would God himself. That they might be baptized in the name of their leader rather than God. They were thinking of their specific earthly leader as having the perfect authority of God rather than that of imperfect humans. They were giving authority to these teachers instead of God. They were ready to believe whatever they were told by their favorite teacher to the exclusion of all others and often even the Bible itself. They were making gods really out of their leaders. Verse 16. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Well, it is very surprising to me that so many Bible scholars misunderstand so much of the Bible. I talked a while back about a Bible scholar trying to prove the date of the uh, crucifixion of Christ by tracking down a solar eclipse of the sun. But he should know on Passover, there's always a full moon. A solar eclipse is impossible. But revered Bible scholars make glaring mistakes about Scripture all the time. And I've been shocked, quite frankly, at some of their conclusions. It actually takes more than just reading our Bibles. We need to pray for wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit to help teach us. The lack of the Holy Spirit allows the academic world, who otherwise are great at analyzing our other historical works, to flounder at trying to understand the Word of God. Verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, notice, them which are called and given the Holy Spirit. And to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. And if those Bible scholars have not been called of God, then they will be confused and confounded by the Bible, and they will not understand. Verse 27. But God has chosen to has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So you might say, everyday people, if you want to call us that, everyday people called by God can run circles around professional Bible scholars that have yet to be called and receive God's Holy Spirit. That's obvious. You can see that today. Verse 28. And base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yes, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The glory goes to God, not to a teacher or a leader here on the earth. Verse 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. We should not be divided. You know, back in verse 10, Paul instructed us that we should all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among us, but that we perfectly be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. A well, lot's happened since Paul gave that advice. The paganism has crept into the church. People are being taught today that Christ paid for our sins and there's no longer any need even to try to keep God's commandments. In fact, one person said you're being pharisaical and you shouldn't even try. That came from a minister. All of God's Sabbath days, for example, now today they're lost to most. It's become difficult to speak the same thing, to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment because there are so many different teachings out there today. We're brought up as children to believe many different things and often to shun anyone that has a different idea of the truth. But one thing Christians can do today is to stop dividing ourselves. We should get together, share our differences and discuss them. And perhaps together we can come to an even better understanding and grow closer to being that same mind. Something that can never happen as long as we separate ourselves from each other. Something that will never happen as long as we treat our leaders as gods themselves, elevating them above all men. And as I said, in some cases, possibly even God himself. Okay, so what if we all got together and dropped all the denominational barriers? How would we deal with people who are not on the same page as us individually? Well, actually, at this time, there are probably not two people who can agree 100% on every part of the Bible. And if we're honest with each other, we probably know that's true. As I said earlier, we won't understand everything perfectly just yet. Some newer to the faith need time to catch up with others who've been around for a while. I know that many really struggle when they find out that much of what they were taught previously simply isn't true. Well, it's a huge adjustment. I know it's hard to believe. And it sometimes takes a while to let it sink in. Sometimes it takes years. I've seen it. This is where we need to be patient with them, patient with people that are learning. Still others, not so new to the faith, have differing ideas about some of the finer points of the Bible. And to be honest, some things just aren't perfectly clear, and they won't be settled until Christ comes back. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 with me, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. So if we were able to eliminate all the man-made Christian divisions out there, then how do we deal with those who don't always agree with us? Let's look to Paul for some advice in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, for bearing one another in love. Let's stop for a moment and take a closer look at verse 2. I don't want to gloss over this right now. 
we might just tend to pass over those two words in verse 2. No pun intended, by the way. But the word lowliness means to be humble, and meekness means to be gentle. Long-suffering means that we're to be patient with them. What about the word forbearing? What about the word forbearing? What does the word forbearing mean? Well, it's a Greek word G430 in Strong's, and it's anik amahi. And it means to bear with or to endure. So forbearing means to tolerate or to put up with. Let me read verse 2 again, this time in the Good News translation of the Bible. Ephesians 4 verse 2. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. So for those who are just beginning to learn, or perhaps those who disagree with us, we should never be arrogant, full of consternation, or short with them. However, being tolerant of others does not mean tolerating or encouraging sin. It does mean tolerating or putting up with different stages of growth in the faith. We're all different places in our understanding of Scripture. All of us are, and that's okay. Paul tells us to always remain humble, gentle, patient, and tolerant of others. Verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We do need to keep, we need to do our very best, that is, to keep unity with each other. But there are always going to be times when sooner or later we will have our differences. But now, thanks to Paul, we know how to deal with this when it comes down to it. But there is just one God, one Bible, and actually there's only one church. Let's continue in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith. Just one faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. <clears throat> Wherefore he said, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Gifts? What gifts? Drop down to verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. But notice next in verse 12 that we are to perfect ourselves. We're not perfect yet. We're all a work in progress. And we need to use our gifts for, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are to continue to perfect ourselves. We're to continue to study the Word of God and work together until, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or woman, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. No, we're not perfect today, of course. We shouldn't expect to be. But we also shouldn't expect our friends our brothers and sisters, or even our leaders to be perfect just yet. But if we're to be perfect, we need to grow. We need to repent. We need to study the Word. We never want to be satisfied or complacent with where we are. But we do need to be like those Bereans and learn to rightly divide the Word of Truth for ourselves. We need to prove all things to ourselves using our own Bibles. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And there are plenty of people doing that today, trust me. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Christ is our head, no one else. Verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body 
and to the edifying of itself in love. Now, we can't do this alone. We really need the brethren, the other parts of the body, if you will, to help us. Not just any pastor or leader, any one person. All the parts need to work together. We need to let all our gifts from God work together while we remain humble and contribute in the ways that we can, according to the gifts God has given to each and every one of us. Verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over into lasciviousness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ." If so, be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It reminds me of baptism. And you shall put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. We are members of one of another. Be you angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So to be kind to each other, forgiving each other. I'll share an incredible story about that in just a few minutes. So what about those other Christians who are not in our church or group? Perhaps those who believe differently from us. Should we shun them, as I was told when I was a child? Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. We'll start right there in verse 1. That's Romans chapter 14. How does God instruct us to treat those who might have different beliefs than we do? Should we shun them? Should we avoid them? Should we stone them? Well, let's see. Romans chapter 14. I'll be reading this from the contemporary English version. Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Welcome all the Lord's followers, even those whose faith is weak. Don't criticize them for having beliefs that are different from yours. Or as the King James says, don't get into an argument over differences of opinion. We don't want to get into an argument with those who believe differently from us. Verse 2. Some think it is all right to eat anything, while those whose faith is weak will eat only vegetables. Now, when Paul was talking about eating anything, it was assumed he was talking about clean animals, of course. Now, God gave us instructions about which animals were good for food. And nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that we can't eat meat today. Those who are vegetarians, for religious reasons, were considered weak in the faith since they obviously didn't understand that God does not require or even ask us to be vegetarians. But there were those in that day that believed that they should not eat meat at all. They were vegetarians due to their religious beliefs. Paul tells us that we shouldn't give those vegetarians a hard time. Not that there's anything wrong about being a vegetarian, but there's no religious reason to do so. Verse 3. But you should not criticize others for eating or for not eating. After all, God welcomes everyone. What right do you have to criticize someone else's servants? Only their Lord can decide if they are doing right. And the Lord will make sure that they do right. I'll say sooner or later he will. Verse 5. Some of the Lord's fathers, followers think one day is more important than another. Others think all days are the same. But each of you should make up your own mind. 
So let's pause here briefly. You might want to hold your place here in Romans. We're coming right back to it. You know, there's some that will claim that verse 5 means a Sabbath day doesn't matter anymore. It has been done away or something like that. But this is not talking about the Sabbath day at all. What days are being discussed in verse 5? Again, hold your place here in Romans and let's turn over to Luke 18, verse 11. That's Luke chapter 18 and verse 11. Luke 18, verse 11. The Pharisees, as you probably recall, were always adding to the law or God's commandments. Now, we can fast anytime we want. You know, it's a good thing to fast. Don't get me wrong, but God only requires us to fast once per year on the Day of Atonement. Now, that's a mandatory fast. It's the only one. At least some of the Pharisees had dedicated fast days that they believed served God. More specifically, some fasted on Mondays and Thursdays, twice every week. We can see that here in Luke. Again, Luke 18, verse 11. The Pharisees stood and prayed thus with themselves, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. And the person identified here is a Pharisee, of course. But notice in verse 12 that he fasted twice a week, and he believed this was what he was supposed to do to honor God. It was part of his belief, verse 12. Here's what he said. I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. So to this Pharisee, there were two days of the week that were considered more important than the others. There were other Pharisees that only had one day a week dedicated to fasting. Still others considered all the days of the week the same. They had no days set aside for fasting. They considered all days alike when it came to whenever they fasted. The subject here was about eating and fasting. God's Sabbath days were given. All the Jews observed the Sabbaths in those days. That was, that was not a question. Let's go back to Romans 14, verse 6. If you would, let's hope you, hope you held your place there. That's Romans 14, verse 6. Continue there. Any followers who count one day more important than another day do it to honor the Lord. Now, they were fasting that day because they sincerely believed it honored God. Okay? And any followers who eat meat give thanks to God, just like the ones who don't eat meat. Again, those refusing meat believed they were honoring God by doing so. But it didn't really matter to God if they ate meat or not. Verse 7. Whether we live or die, it must be for God rather than for ourselves. Whether we live or die, it must be for the Lord. Alive or dead, we still belong to the Lord. This is because Christ died and rose to life, so that he would be the Lord of the dead and the living. Why do you criticize other followers of the Lord? Why do you look down on them? The day is coming when God will judge all of us. And it's like I said, none of us is perfect today, and none of us understand everything perfectly just yet. We just don't. But if people are sincerely trying to follow Jesus Christ, we should respect that. I know I certainly do. And that's why we welcome everyone, just as God says he does back in verse 3. After all, it's possible we could have a few things wrong ourselves, right? I'm sure we do. Verse 11. In the scriptures, God says, I swear by my very life that everyone will kneel down and praise my name. And so each of us must give an account to God for what we do. We must stop judging others. We must also make up our minds not to upset anyone's faith. The Lord Jesus has made it clear to me that God considers all foods fit to eat. Again, that's the clean only. The unclean is not food. But if you think some foods are unfit to eat, then for you, they're not fit. If you're hurting others by the food you eat, you're not guided by love. Don't let your appetite destroy someone Christ died for. But I think about ourselves. You know, if our dining companions order pork for dinner, knowing we don't eat pork for religious reasons, how might we feel? So we can, we can give up a little bit to uh, encourage our brothers and sisters. Verse 15. If you are hurting others by the food you eat, you're not guided by love. Don't let your appetite destroy someone Christ died for. Don't let your right to eat bring shame to Christ. God's kingdom isn't about eating and drinking. It's about pleasing God. About living in peace. And about true happiness. 
All this comes from the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ in this way, you will please God and be respected by people. We should try to live at peace and help each other have a strong faith. Don't let your appetite destroy what God has done. All foods are fit to eat, but it is wrong to cause problems for others by what you eat. It is best not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that causes problems for other followers of the Lord. What you believe, <clears throat> what you believe about these things should be kept between you and God. You're fortunate if your actions don't make you have doubts. But if you do have doubts about what you eat, you're going against your beliefs, and you know that it is wrong, because anything you do against your beliefs is sin. So if we believe something to sin and we do it anyway, then thus it's a sin. I like to talk. Excuse me. <clears throat> I like to emphasize that we are to be tolerant of other followers of Jesus Christ that have beliefs that don't always align perfectly with ours. Turn to Colossians 3, verse 12 next, if you would. Colossians 3, verse 12. Let's look at another set of instructions that show us how we should act as followers of Jesus Christ. Again, that's Colossians 3, verse 12. All right. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, Meekness, long-suffering, meaning patience, forbearing one another. Or in other words, being tolerant of others. And forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. We're to be tolerant of others, and if we do have a quarrel with another, we're to forgive them. I can tell you a true story that I witnessed myself. It was several years ago, uh, two of the brethren were attending a church service, and these two had differing beliefs on one particular subject. Well, I personally believe there was not that much difference in their beliefs. They seemed very trivial to me, their beliefs, that is. But one of the brethren practically attacked the other one over his belief. There was a bit of name-calling, and he told the other brother, who was shocked to say the least, that he would, he'd be losing his salvation over this. The other brother said little. He was mostly silent. He was most likely a bit stunned, but he didn't argue. He didn't, he didn't argue back. If you were the person that was attacked, how would you have felt? And more importantly, how would you have treated the person that launched this attack in the church? Let me tell you how the man that underwent that attack reacted. It was years later. They both ended up again at a church at the same time. Uh, actually, this was a feast the Feast of Tabernacles, and the attacker needed accommodations for the night. Learning of this, the man who'd seen an attack years earlier from this man, gave up his room so that this man would have a place to stay that evening. Just as we read in Colossians 3, verse 13, this man was originally tolerant of the first man's opposing belief. Then he forgave this man for the quarrel they had and even went out of his way to accommodate the first man so that he would have a place to stay at the feast. I'm not sure I've ever seen a better example of tolerance and forgiveness. I suppose I really shouldn't be surprised, though, because that's exactly how a follower of Christ is supposed to act. To conclude today, no one, no denomination of Christianity, no person, except Jesus Christ, of course. No person understands everything perfectly today. We're all still learning and growing in Christ. The church actually includes all those that sincerely do their best as followers of Jesus Christ. There should never be divisions among us. No barriers to those seeking God. We should never shun those who don't agree completely with us. Instead, we should welcome them. After all, we could be wrong about a few things ourselves. They may have the answers for us. But we should never encourage or tolerate sin. Never do that. But we should forbear one another. We should be tolerant and patient with each other as we all seek to learn and grow closer to the one true God. And we should always do so, of course, with love for each other. Colossians 3, verse 12, to end today, we'll read verses 12 through 15. That's Colossians 3, verse 12. 
We read part of this earlier today, but I'd like to read it again. This time I'll be reading this in the International Standard Version. I believe these three verses sum a message today very well. Again, Colossians 3, verse 12 to end today. Good message for us. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Be tolerant of one another and forgive each other if anyone has a complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also should forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which ties everything together in unity. Let the peace of the Messiah also rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. For our closing hymn, we will sing page 246, Ambassadors for Christ, by Ross Jetsam. After we sing, Alan will come off our closing prayer. That's page 246, Ambassadors for Christ. Christ, the Savior of all.